So we're going to spend uh, just a little bit of time in, uh, in Nehemiah. And for those of you who uh, have been with us at 8 o'clock, uh, some of this may be review and, and you've heard it, but you know, it's review for, for the Word of God is always good. You can never get too much of the Word of God. It's like I can never get too much of chicken. You know, Carolyn says, are you sure? You want, I, I, yes, I can eat chicken every day. So, you know, the word of God is just, you know, man, never get tired of it. Uh, we're going to spend most of our time in kind of walking through chapter one, chapter two, um, and time providing um, you know, maybe venture into a few others, but if you have your Bibles, um, with you turn to uh, the first chapter of Nehemiah. As you're turning, I, I want to let you know that um, Nehemiah's God uh, is our God. And what we what we hope we gain out of uh, the book of Nehemiah is a sense for uh, principles that he will show us um, that we can apply in our lives today. See, the things that Nehemiah was experiencing were for him and for the people of Israel at that time. And, and you know, most of you know the story. If you haven't read Nehemiah, it's a, it's a good read. In fact, it's better than going to the movies. It, it is a serious drama. And, and if you spend time in it, you'll be captivated by the things that, that go on. Um, but he, he shares with us principles that can be applied today. See, none of us will ever be called upon to lead a group of people to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem in 52 days. And that's what Nehemiah did, and we, we will never do that. Now, we may be called on to rebuild something in 52 days or 52 weeks or 52 years, and I submit to you that each of us sitting here today, no matter how old you are, you, know, you could be four years old like my grandson Matthew, or, or well, I'm not gonna talk about the oldest person in the room, but you could be the oldest person in the room. God has a plan, a very specific plan for each of us, even where you are, right where you are. Nehemiah, um, why don't we start off and, and I'll read the first uh, three, four verses and we'll pray and, and then we'll, uh, we'll walk through this. Uh, the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hekeliah. Now it happened in the month Chislev, in the, sev in the 20th year, while I was in Susa, the capital, that Hanani, one of my brothers, and some men from Judah came, and I asked them concerning the Jews who had escaped and had survived the captivity and about Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who survived the captivity are in great distress and reproach, and the wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are burned with fire. Now it came about when I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And Father, we are, um, we are before you today, and as we think about circumstances in our lives and uh, other people's lives, the, the neighborhood that uh, our church is in, the, the culture, the world, the, the United States, uh, it makes us, Lord, want to sit down and just weep 
and mourn. We are in desperate situation, God. And so we turn to you, Father, knowing that um, you have the answers, you have the plan. And so we turn to you looking for your guidance and your direction for how we can be used of you, uh, that your plan would be successful, that we can be a part of your victory. And we desire, Lord God, to understand that for our lives. And so this morning we ask you to, uh, by the power of your spirit, uh, guide, teach, and edify, and we will give you glory in Christ's name. We do pray. There are several things in in Nehemiah that uh, we want to focus on. Um, It's a book about leadership. Nehemiah is a great leader. Uh, It's about knowing and understanding the will of God for our lives. Uh, It's about prayer. When you read Nehemiah, you, you can't turn these pages without understanding that this man prayed. It's about knowing God. You see, some people pray and they don't know God, and so their prayers don't go anywhere. It's about opposition. It's about facing opposition in this world. And, and so we want to just spend a little bit of time to touch on, uh, on each of those. Uh, if you um, stay with me. Now, if, if David was sitting, standing here and I was sitting out there, he would be looking at me, and I'll confess this only once, my head would bobble every now and then, <laughs> not because of his preaching, um, well, maybe sometimes, but <laughs> so I'm watching for the bobbleheads, okay, <laughs> I may do something to stir it up. Uh, but uh, pray with me as we, as we go through here. Nehemiah is uh, a cupbearer. And when you, when you hear that word cupbearer, you may get different impressions about what that is. Um, but in these times, a cupbearer was a really, really, really important person, particularly if they were to cup there for the main king. I mean, not not the prime minister, but the king. And and Nehemiah is cup bearer to the king. And another word for this might be chief butler. And and he was responsible for managing the the food and the drink for the king and and other um, palace affairs. And so being the chief butler, there were other butlers that he managed. And and that's the way this structure was set up. So because of context and history, you kind of understand that this man was not just a servant, but he was a special man. And so when his brother and uh, one of his brothers and some of the men came to him and they were visiting with him and they told him about the condition of, of things in Jerusalem, he, he, was, he was hurt, he was devastated. The other thing that you need to know about him is that he may have never been actually in Jerusalem uh, because he was in Babylon and, and, and Israel was sent to Babylon and was there. God said, I'm gonna put you there for 70 years. And, and so Nehemiah probably never saw Jerusalem in the walls, but he heard how devastated the people were. And, and so in verse 4, we see here that he, he wept and he mourned and he cried for days. Have you ever been so sad that you just 
could not stop crying. That you just, like David said, my pillow is wet with my tears. Well, that's the way Nehemiah, he just prayed and wept and mourned for days. And so he prayed to God, the God of heaven. And these verses, 5 through 11, really establish a foundation for us to understand Nehemiah. What we understand is that he was a great leader. You'll see in here that he knew the word of God, that he knew God for himself, that he was humble, and he was a man of vision. In verse 5, you see him exalting God. And I said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who preserves the covenant and loving kindness for those who love him and keep his commandments. So he's, a, he's exalting God as the only God, the God of heaven. The God who created the heavens and the earth. The God who, who committed to a covenant between his people and himself. In, in verses 6 and 7, he confesses. He, he confesses the sin of, of himself and his people and his family. Think about that. He wasn't there when Israel committed the sins that they committed. He wasn't even born. But he was so humble in his prayer and confessing that he wanted God to understand that he was totally, totally giving himself up. And, one, and, and you see, we can't expect to hear from God unless we are cleansed from sin. Sin is a block. It, it, it's a, it, it, it's a, 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 a barrier between our hearts and God's heart. God cannot look on sin. He can't be in the presence of sin. He is holy, holy, holy. And so Nehemiah took no chances. He wanted to hear from God. And so he confessed total, God, we have sinned against you and done all manner of evil. So after he confesses in verses 8, 9, and 10, he then begins to remind God. Have you ever tried to remind God? Now, the other thing about Nehemiah is that we see God's attributes throughout the, the drama. And, and one of them here, Nehemiah is challenging because he's saying in verse 8, remember the word which thou didst command thy servant Moses. Now, I scratched my head when I read that because, I, wait a minute, if God gave Moses the word, how could God forget, first of all? Second of all, God is omniscient. He knows everything. Amen. He is eternal. There is nothing that he doesn't know. There is no place he isn't right now. And so why does Nehemiah say, remember? Well, it's, it's a form of communication. It, it, it's a sense of saying, God, I read in your word, and, and, and it's praying his word back to him. God, I, I read in your word where you said, you know what, if you people keep sinning, I'm going to send you into captivity. But I also read, Lord, look at verse 9. But if you return to me 
and keep my commandments and do them, though those of you who have been scattered were in the most remote parts of the heavens, I will gather them from there and will bring them back. So he's saying, God, I remember. And because I remember and because I know that you remember, I'm about to ask you something. So you can't ask God anything unless you know what to ask for. What are you going to, if you don't read his word, if you don't spend time with him, how will you know what to ask for? We, we communicate with God by the power of the Holy Spirit. Without him, we, 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 we are not able to communicate with God. In fact, in, in Romans, it says that when we are not able to articulate our words, the Holy Spirit interprets our groanings for us. So he's about to ask something really, really important. In verse 10, he says, O Lord, I beseech thee, may thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and the prayer of thy servants who delight to revere thy name and make thy servant successful today and grant him compassion before this man. Now I was the cupbearer to the king. This prayer, this part of his prayer, is, is one of asking for deliverance. The words there for prayer are similar to the word that you, you see in the New Testament when Jesus is, is coming into Jerusalem and, and they're, they're laying down palms and branches and clothes and it just... They're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. That means deliver us. Hoshane, deliver us. In his prayer, Nehemiah is saying, God, deliver us. Make us successful today before this man. Why this man? This man is Artaxerxes. And, and he is the man, the king, that, and you got to go back and read Ezra. Mm -hmm. This is the man that shut down the work that had begun on the wall in the first place. Mm -hmm. See, drama. Did, do y'all watch, I know y'all don't watch uh, stories and all that stuff and the soap <laughs> operas, but I am captivated by this one Series scandal. Do you all, anybody? <laughs> Oof, okay. <laughs> all right. Well, this has all of, th this, this book has conspiracy and scandal in it. You, you, when, when you read through, I t go home today and read through Nehemiah, you're going to see scandals and conspiracy and, and spies and stuff. Well, this king shut down the work on the wall. Nehemiah knew that. So Nehemiah said, God, only you can change the heart of this king. Proverbs 21.1 says, the heart of the king is in, let me get it right, is in the hand of the Lord. Thank you, Pastor Bill. And, and he turns it where he wants it to go. Okay? So, so don't be concerned because the governor and the mayor and the president are voting the way they vote. God's got it. Okay? Do not... Be concerned. Now, that doesn't mean we don't continue to work, but don't be concerned. 
So God gives him success. I'll tell you that. In chapter 2, we see Nehemiah's success. In the first eight verses, we, we see Nehemiah, the, the, the results of his prayer. Remember in, in verse 1 of chapter 1, it says, Now it happened in the month Chislev, in the 20th year, while I was in Susa, the capital. Well, that's in, in the November, December time frame in the Jewish calendar. So if you look at chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And it came about in the month Nisan, in the 20th year, same year, different month, of King Artaxerxes, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine, gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence before. So about four months. Now when Nehemiah prayed, he was, what did he say? Give thy servant success today. So isn't that how we pray? Lord, I need you to make this happen today. And then today becomes tomorrow. Tomorrow becomes next month. For Nehemiah, it was four months before God opened the door and gave him an opportunity. Now, I'll tell you shortly here that Nehemiah took the wine before the king, and he was sad. That's not good. If I'm Larry's cupbearer, and, and I'm bringing him some water, and I'm looking bad, he ain't going to take this water. Uh-uh. Thank you, brother. The king looked at him and said, hmm, what's up? Because he had never been sad. You can't be sad before the king. Two reasons. One, the king saying something is wrong with my food. Or something is wrong with me. Because when, you, when you're in the presence of the king and you look sad, then he begins to think, did I put my clothes on right? He's embarrassed. And you never want to embarrass the king. Because if you do, your head gets chopped off. So this was a serious point. So the king said to him, Nehemiah, you, you never are sad. What is wrong with you? And so Nehemiah tells him, I'm in, I'm in a bad situation. My people are, are in distress. The walls are down. And, and you would, if you were me, I, you would be sad too. So the king says to him, well, what would you desire? <sighs> That's what he was waiting for. What do you want? Nehemiah, before he answered, he prayed. And then he said to the king, if it please the king, in verse 5, if your servant has found favor before you, send me to Judah, to the city of my father's tombs, that I may rebuild it. And so the king does. So now, the benefit of, of what's happening here is that for four months, Nehemiah was praying and planning. You see, that's what leaders do. Leaders pray and plan. And, and they get prepared to execute because they know that God is going to answer their prayer. They may not know when, but they know that he will. Now, these are leaders that have a, an intimate relationship with God. See, if you are a leader and you don't spend time with God, and you don't spend time in his word, and you don't pray, you don't know what to plan for, you don't know when God is going to, you, you, you just, you had a lost. So Nehemiah was ready. So what we see is that Nehemiah, when the, when the king said, you can go, he then responded and said, Lord, uh, king, after he prayed to the Lord, King, give me letters so I can take to the forest people, the people who manage all of the wood and lumber, so that I can take that with me and, and rebuild the walls and, and build myself a house at the same time. And, and he said, also, send, send some protection with me and, and send letters to the folks who, who manage the borders so that they can let me through. 
he was prepared. In, in verses 9 through 16, uh, we see Nehemiah uh, executing on the plan specifically. He gets to Jerusalem and, and he starts to walk around to see the condition of the walls. Remember, he's never been there. So he, he, he's been planning all of this time without seeing. So he goes out and inspects the walls. You all remember when, when Pastor David first came to Manna um, about, I don't know what, five, six years ago. And, and as a leader, um, you know, he came in and and, and I know one of the things he did was made an assessment. See, leaders, good leaders, before you go in and just start moving stuff around, you make an assessment. You talk to people, you find out what's going on. Now, when you go into a bad situation, you're never going to find 100% of the people in your corner, okay? So Nehemiah knew that. And what you'll see is that Nehemiah was praying all along the way. In fact, he didn't even tell the officials of Jerusalem what was going on until he went and saw the walls and, and, and got some information from a few people. And then he sat down and met with the people. Turn over to verse 17. He then said to them, you see the bad situation we are in, that Jerusalem is desolate and its gates burned by fire. Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer be a reproach. And I told them how the hand of my God had been favorable to me and also about the king's words which he had spoken to me. They said, let us arise and build. So they put their hands to the good work. Man, look at that. The hand of my God had been favorable to me. How many of you are blessed and highly favored? Amen. Good, good. Do you know why you're blessed and highly favored? Huh? The hand of God. Absolutely. So... Some people will, will, will say I'm blessed and highly favored and, and they're walking in sin. They, they don't like people. If you cross them, they'll say you know, things out of their mouth they shouldn't say. But then when you see them, how you doing? Oh, I'm blessed and highly favored. <laughs> Nehemiah's example of being blessed and highly favored is based on the fact that he stayed in the word of God like his partner Ezra. In fact, turn to Ezra really quick. I'll show you this. Turn to chapter 7 of Ezra. Look at verse 9. For on the first of the first month, he began to go up from Babylon. And on the first of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem, because the good hand of his God was upon him. For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. So you see the word there for? That word is a connector to verse nine. In other words, the for tells you why Nehemiah, the good hand of the Lord was on Nehemiah. 
because, you could put because in there or therefore, because Nehemiah, I mean, I'm sorry, Ezra, Ezra, what did he do? He studied the law of the Lord and practiced it and he taught it. Now, it wasn't that he, he just did that. The word there, set, or prepared, in the King James it may be, is the word that means he firmly made up his mind to do these things. So, as an example, how many of you have set your mind to reading the word through in a year, this year, 2013. Okay, now you know what that means. Now all of y'all said amen. Okay, and it's easy to say amen. Today is the 13th. How many of you have missed a day? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. You can make it up. Yes, indeed. You can absolutely make it up. God, God, see, to God, it's all one day. See, he's eternal. And, and so if you miss, and, and just so you know, I've missed a day or two myself, okay? But don't continue to do that. All right? So there's 365 days. If you only do it 180, that ain't, that's not getting it. Okay? You got to make it a commitment. Make it an appointment. Ladies, I know that you all don't miss no hair appointments. <laughs> huh? Nail appointments. Doctor's appointments. Dentist appointments. Every one of you picks up your check on Friday. Well, God is just asking for the same commitment. And that's what Ezra and Nehemiah did. That's why the favor of God was upon him, because he spent time in the Word. He read it, he taught it, he practiced it. See, that, 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 that when you can practice it, that's when we know you're reading it. This room is, is nearly filled. There's hardly a seat in here. On Wednesday night, I don't even have to say no more. Y'all know exactly what I'm saying. If there was an afternoon service today, and see, today is a, is, you know, the Ravens played yesterday, but there's two more games today. If, if, if the pastor said, I need five men to go with me to visit the sick today, he might get two. Now, now, this is for all of us. Don't go quiet on me. This is for all of us. Okay? The, Nehemiah, the book of Nehemiah is about restoration and revival. You see, manna... We've been here 40 years, and hundreds of people have come through those doors. Hundreds of people have been saved. And yet, if you look around us, if you look around in this neighborhood, it's hard to believe. In fact, if you came through this neighborhood and, and you were a sinner, you wouldn't know that there were churches here. Truth be told. And so Nehemiah is a call. A call to each of us. And it doesn't have to be simply the work in our neighborhood. That, that's important. It can be right in your family where you are. What relationships need to be restored in your family? I submit to you that if your family relationships are 
are dysfunctional, then you won't be able to serve in the neighborhood. Restoration. 